Good afternoon from a from a great day here in Virginia. Beautiful uh, summer day early. I'm Ricky Ellison. I'm the founder and chairman of the Missile Defense Advocacy Alliance. We are on the sole mission to educate and advocate for the deployment development of missile defense systems around the world, and especially for our national security in our country. I've been doing it for 40 years. We created an MDA 20 years ago and been through, I think, seven seven presidents uh, administrations from all the way back in 1983 to where we are today. We are excited. This is our 50th uh, virtual, 50th congressional roundtable. Before virtual, we actually were in Congress doing these tables of discussions. So this is our 50th one and comes out of just a great time uh, when Congress today and this week and and most likely next week, we'll come up with their final National Defense Authorization Act and putting forward the missile defense priorities as we see it. And we'll gather probably one of our best teams ever, I think, from us. We've got over 137 years of experience in policy and in operations and in acquisition. So today I have the former Undersecretary of Policy, John Rude, with us. We probably have I'm going to say the best F-22 pilot in the country, and I want to welcome Charles Cochran, former, just recently retired Major General, onto our board. Uh, he is uh, accepted to be on our board uh, of MDA, and he will be here as a former, uh, just recently, uh, Deputy Assistant of Operations for the U.S. Air Force. And we have Neil Thurgood, who had 37 years in the Army, and uh, also former MDA test director, but on the rapid acquisition for the Army. So that, that's a phenomenal uh, person to have with us. And we end with a, a, you know, one of our best intellects, I think, in, a national security asset, Mark Montgomery, who's had, uh, I think he's had about 32 years in operations. But more importantly, the last five years, he's been on the Hill actively involved with Congress. So th that's our team tonight. That's, our, that's where we're going to come to you from. So we understand that the, that the NDAA is, is really Congress's ability to balance and check the administration and put forward from the people's perspective of what should be uh, done, both really in policy and in investment in current capability and future capability. That's, that's what this act does. And it also goes for a five-year plan of acquisition development during that. So this, this act begins a five-year plan to end in 2028. From our perspective, 2028 is a long ways away, and we are going to see real threats, and we need to deter those threats before 28. So heavy investment should be going into capacity, the current capacity right now, and certainly policy to enable us to use our capacity that we do have against the threats. And the threats have been established by the Secretary of Defense in 2021, by the President of the United States, and continue to be reaffirmed in testimony this week, last week, with our COCOMs and with our OSD Policy Department of Defense for the pacing trap threat. The number one threat to the United States of America is China. The number two threat is Russia, and that's where it stands. Those are the two major players. And if you look back two years from here, on February 4th, 2022, in Peking, in the opening of the Olympic Games there, President Putin and Xi Jinping were together, and they made a joint statement with the Russian Federation and the People's Republic of China to establish international relations in a new era with global sustainability. 20 days from that speech, Russia declared a war that they're still in with Ukraine. That war has seen over 6,000 missiles, 300,000 casualties, and billions and billions of dollars of destruction and infrastructure. And the other side, five months since that agreement, our Speaker of the House traveled to Taiwan 
and the Chinese have done a record high, doubled flight intrusions illegally into Taiwan airspace, 1,737 over the past year, and demonstrated missile shots in and around, not in, around Taiwan, and their overmatching of that. That's a real threat. And we have generals that have publicly said that 2025 is an opportune time for the Chinese to, 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 make, a, to make a mark on or take back Taiwan. So what we're doing has to be done, and it has to be done to deter their abilities to, to, to do what they're doing today. So I like to you know, focus on three major areas of the world, starting with our U.S. homeland. And do we have the policies, first off, to enable us to be able to create capabilities that in defense that can deter the Chinese and Russian threat to the North American continent? And we've got to look at current capabilities that we have to have between now and 28. We then move to look at Guam, that we're going to spend over $8 billion, us, American taxpayers, on a missile defense capability to defend our forward projection force in the Pacific. And we ask, you've got to have hypersonic glide defense. You can't build a system over the next six, seven years that does not have the ability to track create fire control, and to be able to shoot down a hypersonic glide. Us, you build that, and they've got one or two of those missiles that are undefensible to do it. And so that has got to be looked at at a very serious manner because we are not getting a hypersonic glide vehicle defense until the mid-2030s. We are investing less than 2% right now of our defense budget on development of that. We're investing less than 1% on our HPTSS, which is a demonstration where we believe that you can get a constellation of 24 HPTSs and get the glide phase boost interceptor, of using glide phase interceptor in place by 28. That's critical. That is a big part. And then we look at Europe. And you look at Europe, and, and we've spent probably close to 20 billion in operations and capability development on the European phase adaptive approach that has vast capacity against ballistic missile defense, but it is not allowed to go against Russia. It is built specifically for the defense of Europe from Iran. And we have problems in Europe that we have two separate, and, and same with the United States, that we have a separate BMD capability and then a separate cruise missile and air defense capability that have to be merged. And we have to have open architecture with our allies. We cannot do this alone. So those are some of the big challenges that I see forward. I see this as a great opportunity to discuss those and to vet those out and to take questions. So each of our presenters are going to spend about 10 minutes or so, or seven to 10 minutes. And then at the end, we will, we will have questions. And we're going to start off with the uh, esteemed honorable, uh, former OSD Undersecretary for Policy, John Rude. John, it's all yours. <laughs> Well, thank you, Ricky, for inviting me on, and, and you've got a great panel set, set for this discussion today. The timing of this discussion is also, you know, quite well chosen. So uh, point number one, we really are at a pivotal period in national security history, and if we take a big step back and we look at where we are at right now with a rising China and one of those unique moments in history deciding to openly challenge the United States and others to be the leading power in the world, and on this, they're quite uh, clear, whether it's in the Communist Party of China's documents, the president of China, Xi Jinping's statements, that that is the ambition and to change the global order with China at its center. And, and then we also have this unique period where Russia, another great power, engaged in the largest conflict since World War II, and the two of them forming uh, you know, a growing alliance. And so we are, as a national security establishment in the United States and in the West, pivoting and moving towards that. But I say it's a pivotal moment in that I'm not sure history will look kindly on us that we are moving fast enough. 
And if some of the things that are certainly very live potential options could occur here in the coming years, how will we feel about ourselves and our rate of progress and the way that we're maneuvering to deal with that? And I think we will say we were not moving fast enough or heeding the warning seriously enough should something occur. And I think even if in a conflagration, a conflict does not occur, we're still putting ourselves at a disadvantage to preserve the peace by not having sufficient deterrent capability with missile defenses, with other capabilities, with offense and defense integration that you talked about. Now, in order for us to do that, we have to be cost effective and be smarter about the way we're doing it, not simply throw mass at the problem uh, because that won't be an effective strategy. But there are things that we can be doing with the way that we're using the force, that we're integrating the force, and we're having the roles and responsibilities to efficiently do this. And Congress plays a, a very central role in this. Um, to pivot to a discussion in Congress for just a minute, sometimes when you talk to people that have spent their careers in the executive branch, they tend to think that the president's budget is the centerpiece of that. But if you look at our history, actually, we went for about nearly two centuries when the president never submitted a budget to the Congress. The Constitution gives the central role for policymaking and for uh, the power of the purse to the Congress. The president's budget is a recommendation that the Congress considers. And so as the Congress starts to lead, and I think that's the leading edge of the debate right now about what should our policy aims be? So let me let me make a few fundamental points um, that I think are, are sadly not reflected in policy. First, the greatest threats, and there's bipartisan consensus on this, to the United States and to our way of life are the growth from China, the threat from China, and the threat from Russia, and the growing alliance between them. And yet, our missile defense policy does not allow our military commanders to defend against missile threats from those countries. So imagine the spectacle that President Putin has openly threatened to use missiles and nuclear weapons against our allies in Europe or those that are enabling the Ukrainians to resist his aggression. Uh, that would be the United States as the principal leader of that. If the Russians should attack uh, Poland or an inadvertent missile launch come towards the sites in Romania and Poland that the United States taxpayers have spent several billion dollars in years uh, constructing, developing, equipping, and, and our soldiers are there. Today, those commanders are not able to use those systems to defend themselves. Uh, they always have a right of self-defense, but the policy doesn't enable them to truly protect the surrounding area and against a missile strike from Russia. And, and that needs to be changed. And also, we've spent several billion dollars to equip these sites with missile defense, ballistic missile defense capabilities, but not enabled them to have the ability to defend against cruise missiles or to conduct offensive operations. We need to, as a policy matter, move away from this artificial distinction, which doesn't match the world anymore, that offense and defense are somehow very separate, number one. And number two, that defense against some missiles is okay, but defense against others would not be okay. Um, we need to get to a rather fundamental point that our, our policy is to defend against missile attack from any source to include China and Russia. And we need to begin to have an architecture which is optimized for those purposes. We have a similar situation in the continental United States where the commander of Northern Command, General uh, Van Herc, has testified to the Congress that he doesn't have the policy authority to defend against Russian and missile and, and Chinese strikes on the United States. And this, for ballistic missiles, hypersonic missiles, cruise missiles as well. And in the cruise missile area, what's disappointing about that is that when you look at the suite of capabilities the Russians are demonstrating in the conflict in Ukraine, as you mentioned, some 6,000 missiles launched by the Russians at Ukraine, a large number of those have been cruise missiles from air delivered platforms. And those things were developed by the Russians with the United States principally as the target and the US military as its principal adversary. So one, the Russians are openly stating this as a possibility to include some people may have forgotten during the last administration, President Putin at a national celebration displayed an animation in which the Russian missile attack targeted Florida at a time when the President of the United States had his residence in Florida. 
uh, and, and the video ends with an explosion. Again, this is not a, an accident um, and what the Chinese are talking about. So we need to go to school on the conflict in Ukraine and adapt our policy accordingly. And it, uh, the, in the conflict in Ukraine, Russia has used missiles as a principal weapon of warfare in very high volumes of employment. Their air force is not conducting large scale bombing. The naval forces largely pushed out in the perimeter due to concern of being attacked by the Ukrainian forces. And so you're seeing a, a real adaptation in that conflict for the Russians that's relevant for this audience. And so um, at NATO, there's a policy as an example that the alliance will not uh, defend itself from attack except for from Iran and North Korean missiles. Well, that, that simply doesn't make sense when you have the leader of Russia, A, using missiles in high volume, and B, threatening to use them against the alliance. Uh, there's an upcoming meeting of heads of state and government in just a couple months at NATO, and that would be an opportune time, and, and our administration should be pushing for that change in policy. Uh, that's one of the things I thought Congressman Turner did an excellent job in testimony this week, eliciting from administration witnesses and making the case that that needs to be part of it. Now, transitioning some other things I'd argue that Congress should do. Its principal power is the power of the purse. And so, as an example, the Congress has the full authority to authorize and appropriate the funds necessary to enable the Aegis Ashore sites in Romania and Poland to be fully equipped, including with offensive capabilities, and to direct that they be enabled to have the full capacity for offense and defensive operations that they have at sea. Uh, a similar thing could be done to uh, appropriate, authorize and appropriate funds for cruise missile defense and hypersonic missile defense of the United States. And the programs that we have are set to deliver capabilities embarrassingly late. I mean, close to the turn of the century. Um, again, the Congress can accelerate the deployment dates of the existing systems. They can fund a larger magazine that we have Today's stocks that we have for missile defenses would be woefully inadequate in any conflict in the Pacific or if we came to blows with Russia in Europe. The Congress can change that. Uh, the other thing I would encourage the Congress to do is appropriate money to begin work on space-based defenses. Uh, we are, we're out of step on that as a, as a national security establishment. While we have some, some wonderful green shoots like the Space Development Agency, pursuing uh, tracking layers and transport layers of dramatically less expensive, more distributed architecture, we're still not fully applying that to missile defense. And you mentioned a great example with roles and responsibilities, Ricky, where the Missile Defense Agency has been given the lead by the Congress for missile defense to include hypersonic tracking of missiles. But you know, in the roles and responsibilities, that's another area that Congress can step in and insist that the Missile Defense Agency play the leading role on those areas because we're seeing a turf war emerge between different, depart different parts of the Defense Department in that regard, and that the military services adequately budget for the production of much larger volumes of missile defense capabilities. Think standard missile three interceptors, Patriot interceptors, THAAD interceptors, which we would go through our existing inventories enormously fast in a conflict. Um, but on the space-based area, the Congress can appropriate and, and authorize the funds for pursuit of a space-based defense. And for those that think um, of a time 20 years ago or otherwise when that was seen as infeasible or too expensive, I'd just give you a couple of statistics to show that that simply isn't the case. Um, just last year, in the first six months of 2022, more than 1,000 satellites were placed in orbit. That's more than was placed in orbit from 1957, from the first satellite to that date. And that rate of acceleration has continued. Today, there's 5,500 satellites in orbit, according to the GAO, and that's gonna grow to be 55,000 by the end of this decade. And what you're seeing is very inexpensive, highly capable systems. And so I'll just say, we are not embracing that as a centerpiece of our missile defenses and taking advantage of that high ground. And the cost will be dramatically less than many of the, the negative 
you know, critics are saying, as an example, the Space Development Agency is estimating this is their target goal per satellite, $15 million, according to Derek Tournier, for the transport layer, for communication satellites. Think a similar number of $15 million per copy satellites devoted to missile defense and the impact that could have on a conflict. So I'll just close there and say, you know, as you mentioned, the need to enable a Guam defense. That's another area that Congress is within its full authorities to authorize and appropriate the funds and direct the administration to erect that defense and make it very capable of both offensive and defensive operations. And there's a series of other things, as you mentioned, they can do to accelerate the fielding of the needed capabilities for things like hypersonic crews and ballistic missile defense. So I'll just uh, stop there. We've, there's a lot of other good presenters right behind me, but thank you for having me on, Ricky. Thanks, John. I, I do have two questions and one question. So I, I wanna go back to your, your simplistic viewpoint of roles and responsibilities, because we're having problems in Guam with picking who's in charge on development, on the whole thing there. We're having the senator from Hawaii asking who's in charge of Hawaii. We've got the U.S. homeland where U.S. Air Force has been assigned, I guess, took the architecture of just cruise missile defense. We've got, it looks like we've got JIFIC moving from STRATCOM all the way up to SPACECOM. So there's, there's movements, but we've been built to fight North Korea and Iran on missile defense. We have not been built to fight someone like China or Russia. And it looks like, and that was brought up by Angus King in testimony right off the bat. So I, you've got to help because I don't, is it, is it Congress's duty to make that change or is it the administration's or is it within the services? But we got we to gotta, we gotta put the best command and control structure on this issue and, and, and either open up MBA's ability to do much more research and development, take the authorities and give them the authorities and look at their budget. Their budget's focused on Korea and Iran, not that, that threat where, where we've got to grow. So just hit that real quick. That would be... You're on mute. It's the Congress and the administration leadership, civilian leadership, that they have the ability to really change that. The services uh, do not have the ability to change their roles and responsibilities. They might elbow each other out or try, but it, it's really those two areas. And what it comes down to for me is uh, my short answer in terms of who should be in charge of missile defense and creating the right architecture and developing the right systems. Well, that's the function of the Missile Defense Agency. And history shows when we have created a focused organization to integrate across the services, we've made the most progress. So we need to um, challenge them to play that role and empower them to do so. In with, with regard to who operates the system, to me, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. The answer to the senator from Hawaii would be the commander of Indo-Pacific Command is responsible for operating those systems that are developed by others, or the same thing with other geographic combatant commands, uh, if it's a different part of the world. With regard to the man, train, and equip function, here there is friction, as you mentioned, on Guam between the services. And uh, expecting the services to adjudicate that, I think, is amongst themselves, is not realistic. And history shows that has not typically worked. The, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs can play in this, an advising role there, but the statute that set up the, the JCS also doesn't empower that person to really settle those. And there's a lot of examples in history where chairmen have failed to do so. That's where the Secretary of Defense has got to come in, the civilian leadership and the Congress. And the Congress can direct those things and has in our history. Um, so I think that's where we've got to challenge them to do that. So for example, the Missile Defense Agency should be responsible for what is the proper command and control architecture and the means for architecting the force. I got concerned when I saw some uh, comments in the media in this last week, uh, representative of the Space Development Agency saying, well, we have a different concept in mind for command and control of the missile defense force. Um, you know, not a good sign. That's a sign that we're gonna spend too much money on duplicative solutions that are not fully integrated. And it's tough for the services to do this on their own. Some, like the Air Force, are leading out on things like JADC2 and this idea of global command and control architecture, and I commend them for it, but they're gonna need civilian leadership and they're gonna need the Congress to come in to support that. So that, that'd be my short answer. And 
At some point, the developer and architect of the missile defense systems, read the MDA, needs to hand those over to the services to man, train, and equip, meaning buy the additional production units to man them and to train the force to do that. That's their, been their traditional role. You know, leadership is required to force the services to step up and play that role effectively. Thank you, John. And just one comment, you don't have to question that, but I think when you talked about the Aegis sites, or excuse me, the EPA capabilities, it's not just the two sites in Poland and Romania, it's the four ships, it's the radar, it's the, BM, the BIMDOC, it is a lot of it. And where we're trying to go, I think, is having a portable capability that can just go and defend a city or, or some with a layered defense capability all the way up from hypersonic ballistic all the way down to cruise. And that's kind of the same thing we should be doing in the United States to have that capability on our country that can go anywhere in the country if we wanted to, to be able to self-defend that. So that, we're not just dependent, I don't think, on those VLS tubes in Romania and Poland to put SM6s or so forth on. But I'm saying that that whole architecture is not allowed to be used. So I, that, that was something. Did you want to say something on that? But I'll, I'll, I mean, we're moving. Okay. All right. So you let that Thank in. You. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, John. Really appreciate it. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are moving into one of the best, like I said, the best uh, F-22 pilot. He's going to get some flack for it. Um, Charles Cochran, he, uh, he's had a, a heck of a career. Um, he's been fluent in all the operations with the Air Force and certainly understanding that, that uh, debate between air defense and, and base defense, et cetera, on, on that. So, ladies and gentlemen, our newest board member, uh, Charles Cochran, uh, it's all yours. Corky. Hey, Ricky, thanks for the kind intro, and, and more importantly, thanks for allowing me to uh, to join your uh, elite team there at MDAA. I've been hey, Colby, I want to say one thing. Yeah. Live from New York City, <laughs> I am I am sitting in the building where they, uh, where they, uh, uh, where they do Saturday Night Live here in Rockefeller Center. But hey, thanks again for letting me to join your team. I've been watching for the last 20 years the amazing work you've been doing, and I hope that I can contribute in some meaningful fashion going forward. And thanks to John and, Mar and Mark and Neil for joining today. Uh, it is, like John said, right topic, right time. I know the title today is, is must do uh, for, for the FY24 NDAA. And you asked me to talk a little bit about the Department of the Air Force, the Air Force and Space Force must do's for, for, for that. And I, I, I'd like to focus on the do part of that. Uh, and the fact that there is, as we all know, a big say do gap. We've been saying we're gonna do things for quite some time. And an example I'd say in the Air Force is uh, what we're currently calling ABMS, our contribution to JADC2, started out probably 10 years ago as multi-domain ops, then all domain ops, then multi-domain command and control, et cetera, et cetera. So 10 years conservatively, 10 iterations of NDAAs, 10 iterations of appropriations, and little to no movement forward. Uh, nothing's happening. Uh, and, and despite uh, an exorbitant amount of taxpayer money uh, being thrown at the problem, and meanwhile, as we've already discussed here, the threat is, is rapidly outpacing us, fielding capabilities, uh, two and a half to three times faster than us, uh, if you look at China. But also, uh, you mentioned Russia. I, I still think it's not just China and Russia. I know you guys know this, but uh, we still have Iran. We still have North Korea. We still have rogue actors. The cost of entry into the game where you can send lethal uh, capabilities at the United States or our, or our partners through the air, whether it's uh, small UAVs with explosives, one-way attack UAVs, all the way up to hypersonics and intercontinental ballistics. We need to defend all that across the board, and we, we are just getting outlapped right now by everyone from, from, the, uh, from the lone actor to the Chinas and Russias of the world. And, uh, and so we got to change our way of doing business. So the, the do piece is what I think we need to focus on, and I think Congress needs to focus on putting very specific language in the NDAA. Uh, one of the things, and I, and I know, I know by the way, that the Air Force leadership would like to go faster. You hear it from Secretary Kendall. You hear it from General Brown. You hear it from uh, General Saltzman. Uh, but but how could maybe Congress help in the NDAA? But one of the one of the what I think is the red herring that, that gets thrown around a lot in the building is that we got to choose between spending money on stuff that we can do now and, and really investing in the future. And I, I think that's a bunch of baloney in this day and age, in the digital age. Um, there's nobody better than the U.S. Uh, uh, you know commercial industry uh, at, at fielding stuff and then rapidly updating. And I'll I'll give the iPhone as an example. And maybe it's overused, but. The iPhone 14 dropped last last September, September 22. With it dropped iOS 16. In the intervening uh, eight months, Apple's released 13 new up updates to that software. So they put a piece of hardware out, but they're constantly making it better with the software. And oh, by the way, the software is backward compatible to several other models. 
Tesla's the same way. If you buy a Tesla today and you bought a Tesla four years ago, you're, you're getting basically the same car. The hardware is a little bit different, but the software is the same in those, and Tesla's rapidly updating it. Elon Musk is doing the same thing with SpaceX. He's getting hardware up there, and he's making the hardware such that it can be reconfigured on the fly with new software as, as they, uh, they want to add new capabilities. So so what's the, what should the Air Force do, and how should the NDA help with that? And I would say it applies to the Joint Force. If you look at, at how the how – the, uh, the Joint Force is talking about JADC2. They've they've settled on this uh, mantra of you know sense makes sense act. So the sensors, uh, I'll call the next piece kind of C2, and then act would be the effectors and how you're going to carry it out. So so looking at the sensors and how this would apply, I think um, for you know for as long back as we want to look, we've kind of handcuffed ourselves when we field sensors. We were ha very hardware focused, and we were we focused specifically on a specific threat we're trying to detect. Say it's uh, a, a ballistic missile, and we we program the heart the, the software that we put in to this this widget uh, filters out all the noise that doesn't look like a ballistic missile to make it a very pristine you know very capable uh, of tracking uh, that ballistic missile and it does very good. Well, the problem is there's a lot of stuff in that noise that really matters, and with the processing power and the software we have today, we could actually be looking inside all that noise uh, with the sensors we have and doing a better job of understanding what's out there in the environment. We'll take the Chinese balloon that we recently dealt with as an example. The radars we have fielded saw that balloon. It was filtered out and not presented to the decision makers. So how do you fix that? We don't need to go back and build a piece of hardware and take 20 years to field it so it can track balloons. We need to update the software and our existing sensors. You can do that quickly if you bring in the right people uh, and, and put the right resources to it. And, and it will take a lot of resources. So if I were king in the FY24 NDAA, one of the things I think should be directed is a comprehensive near-term review of everything we have fielded and how we can update those sensors simply by adding better processing power and better software. And that might bring some other actors into the, into the, uh, into the defense game as well rather than the, 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 standard, uh, the standard big companies that, that we see uh, doing most of the work. I think there's a lot of capability out there that's untapped potential uh, across the United States that could help with this. On the other side of it, we do need to field new hardware, obviously, going forward. And we're looking at, you know, we're, we're going to acquire new over-the-horizon radar, radars. We're putting new sensors in Guam, et cetera. We're putting new sensors in space. But we can't take 10, 15 years to put them up there. Again, go back to what I was just talking about. We need to get prototypes fielded as quickly as possible. And the prototypes need to be capable of, of receiving uh, routine software updates because software is the name of the game, rapid software integration. So the NDAA should direct this. It should direct the, the, the faster and more rapid fielding of sensors uh, at a prototype level, and those sensors must be capable of being rapidly reprogrammed, their software. Uh, under the make sense piece, I, I, I would kind of uh, liken this to C2. And again, JAD C2, we've been talking about it for a while. We need to get after the do part. So anything that can be put in the NDAA to be more directive, more prescriptive to the department uh, to should, be, should be done. Uh, the Navy's working uh, their piece of this. The Army's working their piece. The Air, Air Force is working their piece. Uh, but at the end of the day, this is about connective tissue. So I, I think there's all, already a lot of uh, a lot of hardware out there, but there are ways to connect the hardware and get it done now, so that as as uh, John was just saying, we can give the COCOMs what they need to do their job. This is a COCOM mission, and they're screaming for it. Uh, Admiral Aquilino is screaming for what he needs to see to his AOR. And, and the services and MDA need to get after it uh, sooner rather than later. And I think, again, there are, there are software solutions that could be put in place in the very near term, near term to give him what he needs to see to the fight uh, the way he needs to see, see to it. Uh, and then, so sense makes sense, and then act. Under the act piece, now, this is where I, I think it is a little bit more of a hardware game, unfortunately. Uh, you got to have the right effectors, and, and we got to have the right effectors that can deal with hypersonics all the way down to, again, one-way attack, UAVs, and everything in between. So uh, anything we can do uh, in the NDAA to, to expedite uh, the uh, fielding of the effectors we need is a good thing. What I will say is we've got to, uh, we've got to get to affordable mass, uh, especially uh, when you're talking about uh, swarms of you know hundreds, potentially thousands of these smaller things. Uh, we can't afford to be shooting uh, you know, uh, effectors at them that are the cost on the order of magnitude more of the things we're shooting down. This is where I think you can uh, 
find software solutions, leverage cyber, leverage electronic warfare, leverage some directed energy, high power microwave capabilities that are available. So there are companies out there right now, and if, if uh, DOD, if the DOD's uh, acquisition system isn't going to do what, what they need to do to select these companies and get their capability fielded, well, then maybe, maybe Congress needs to get involved and pick some winners and tell the DT, DOD to field them because they'll dem there are demonstrations out there right now. You can see where a lot of these capabilities are available, and they're game changers. We'll have deep magazines to get after some of these lower-end threats, and then we can take our, our really uh, valuable resources and put them towards the hardware we need that, ex that exquisite hardware to take out the high-end threats, these intercontinental ballistic missiles, hypersonics, et cetera. So uh, I guess in summary, I'll, I'll say that uh, I, I think we should, the NDIA needs to focus on the do part of the must do. Uh, I think it's time for Congress uh, to be very, very much more involved, uh, directing quick wins on the software side and directing rapid uh, fielding uh, on the hardware side of prototypes. Uh, I'll stop there, Ricky, thanks. Okay, thanks, thanks, Corky. Um, Let's, let's go into the homeland and sensor gaps. You taught software upgrades on that, but for the low, slow, low heat signature cruise missile capabilities, we, you know, I think we're bringing the E7s, very expensive to operate over the top. You got the over the horizon that, that does have its own limitations, and you've got our radars already that, you know, line of sight of the, you can go underneath those. So the, the dirigible, the, the elevated persistent overhead capability seems like it it's something that, that needs to be relooked at because of what and whether it's the stratosphere all the way down to 20,000 where you can reduce I've seen some study that's 4,000 sorties can do one dirigible for the same deal and I, I'm just wondering what that I mean is that something the Air Force is looking at or are we waiting for satellites in space to do this mission or other things to do this mission? Ricky, we can't afford to wait. It's a great question. We need persistent coverage of every inch of airspace approaching the homeland. And, we, and our allies deserve the same. And so what I would do, we, we need a comprehensive look at the sensors we have fielded now and the, air, the areas that they're covering. What can we do to tweak what they're looking at to maybe uh, allow them to see more things? And then the blank spots, the blind zones, we got to get persistent coverage of those, whether that's with dirigibles, whether it's getting the PLEO fielded on an accelerated basis, whether it's accelerating E7, which the Air Force is trying to do. But all these options need to be on the table. Uh, what we don't need to do is keep trying to fly, uh, you know, 50, 60 year old AWACS airplanes uh, that work about half the time uh, and can't see uh, the threat we're looking for. That's a losing proposition. So. Yeah, all the things you said need to be on the table, and we need to go faster. But I, I think there's a lot of capability that's untapped in the sensors we actually have fielded. For the areas where they are looking, we can we can leverage software so that they can see things better. But there are blind spots, and the blind spots are unacceptable, like you said. So it's, if it's dirigibles, is it's, if it's the P Leo, if it's E7 to help fill gaps, uh, there are there are options with unmanned airplanes and repurposing them. Think like an MQ9 and putting sensors on it. There are electric UAVs that, that are that are that are coming available that can stay up for months at a time. So you, you put some of these things up there with the right sensors, and then it's just having, again, the software on the back end to process all this information and present it to the, to the user. Okay, Kirk, one last question, a more difficult question, is air-based defense. And I know there's an internal debate inside the Air Force whether they should do it, and, and it's Army's mission, but Army's got very limited capability and capacity to do that. And then moving into the hub and spoke, which is what that Guam position is to be able to do ACE and explain that to everybody on the agile ability to defend, you know, air, air bases or airstrips in the first, second island chain and where we're at with that. Is that a roles responsibility mission change requirement or is the Air Force just going to do it on its own? Or where is that when they can't get the capacity or capability from the Army to do that with what they want to do in their strategy? Well, uh, start back with where, where John was, was explaining the, the COCOM spike, all right, and the services prevent for, present forces. So uh, the Air Force and Army, Army, Navy, Marines, Special Operators, they're all going to go forward, say, for Admiral Aquilino. He's gonna, he's, we're going to give him the forces he needs to do what he needs to do. He's going to expect those forces to be protected. The first order of business to protect them is to understand the environment. So the sensors we've already talked about, we've got to get out there. Then what you're, talk then what you're talking about is, is – what are the effectors on the back end or how do we 
you know, use that information to, to uh, you know, make sense and then act on if China starts to lob missiles or, or, or whatever our way. And there is, uh, there are limited resources to do the job. So uh, I think it's going to be up to Admiral Aquilino and his team to choose how he wants to use the uh, capabilities that are given to him, presented to him by the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, Marines to protect uh, the forces that he wants to protect so he can conduct the mission. The Air Force, uh, obviously no organic capability. We are pursuing, the, 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 the service is pursuing, pursuing some things like hypervelocity gun weapon system. Um, but everything that they're pursuing, they're trying to make sure it's integrated with, uh, with MDA's plan for the defense of Guam. It'll integrate with the Army systems. And then the other thing that the Air Force is doing, which you touched on, is, is the passive defense piece of it. Um, the ability to move around hub and spoke uh, to try to uh, deny, uh, deceive, uh, move inside of the Chinese targeting cycle, if you will, so that, so that you aren't anywhere long enough that the Chinese can find you and hit you. That's a dangerous game to play. Uh, we'd, be much, we'd be much better off if we could sense, make sense, and then actually act on any incoming, uh, incoming threats, whether, again, they're small UAVs all the way up to hypersonics and ballistics. So uh, the, debate, the debate needs to continue. But uh, meanwhile, the Air Force is going to do what it can with the resources it have to, to try to protect the forces that, that it'll put forward for Admiral Aquilino, uh, General Cavoli, or anyone else. Thank you. Thanks, Courtney. Okay. I, I, I don't know if I see Neil yet. Um, I, I think we're going to go to Mark. So uh, thank you, Corky. I uh, would like to introduce another board member, uh, Mark Montgomery, uh, to, uh, to go forward. Mark? Hey, thank you, Ricky. Um, look, overall, I'll just talk quickly about the NDAA. I think the, the president's uh, FY24 budget was a uh, was a good starting point. It's going to need quite a bit of modification. Uh, I'll talk directly to kind of some of the systems. You know, I think at uh, Defense of Guam, the department has successfully settled on the, uh, the most expensive, least efficient, and slowest delivered possible plan, but they have settled on it. And I think that's where we are now. Um, yeah, we've I've been through this before, so I won't go through why. It's At some point, if you just wanted to quick have something in 2025 that could have defended you, you would have put an Aegis Ashore deck house with two to three VLSs, um, bought NASAMs, and used and integrated along with the existing THAAD, which all talked through Link 16 and JREAP, and you would have had an effective defense of Guam by 2025. Uh, that opportunity has come and gone. Um, uh, and, and now we're stuck with a very manpower intensive, our army forces intensive, uh, unit structure, which is fine. If our, if people were cheap and everything existed already, we we're doing this in CONUS, that'd be fine. But we're talking about OCONUS, you know, putting a thousand plus people to handle radars, um, trucks, multiple launchers, all replacing, um, uh, replacing a, a very tight, and Asia Shore is 56 operators to include the VLS. And I'll just say 56 doesn't get you any of these Army components I'm about to, it doesn't get you 25% of any of the Army components we're about to tell you. You're going to end up with 1,000 or 2,000 Army soldiers manning this, which means you're going to have to do MILCON, commissaries, elementary schools, everything that goes with it. And a $2 billion plan is going to be $10 billion uh, before you've taken a deep breath. And that's going to really piss people off. But that's, I'm afraid that's where we're headed. I think they're starting to see that cost and temper themselves. So suddenly the idea we put forward last year, build a couple of VLS and shrink the number of, of, um, of, uh, of, of trailers with launchers on them, that's taken forward. Um, the, the, uh, we'll, we'll see what happens, whether they're willing to put Patriot out there or not. And, uh, and but the the if pick is going to be uh, the, the different systems we're talking about are going to result in a lot of people. Um, so with that said, uh, I think that you know with the with the, the budget risk that I see right now, the, the biggest risk is in the if pick. Um, you know we've been arguing for NASAMs for like five years. I think the army has successfully made by arguing for NASAMs both correct and ineffective. Correct in the sense that we gave the NASAMs to the Ukrainians despite any whispering that it wasn't that great a system, it's done pretty well in Ukraine. Um, and we know it's a good system. So much so that the next few NASAM sets to be built will be going to Ukraine. 
So to try to insert the United States into that would delay much needed systems going to Ukraine. And, and it may well be that if PIC can be available now, that, now that it's you know eight to 10 years behind original delivery from when they first started talking about the system to us in 2014, um, it's now at the point where its delivery might be on time, you know, as fast as NASAMS. That's just a kind of a sad statement about everything, but I, I think we might have arrived there. But even given that, the president's budget on IFPIC was wrong in the sense that they only put in effectors that I can see for the LRIP production, the, the initial four launchers, which are not for going to Guam. The 20 PDI, Pacific Deterrence Initiative launchers, have no, no effectors that I can see with them. And again, I need about 360 of them. Those effectors are aimed 9 xs And the earlier you get those ordered, that kind of high number, the better, because they compete with other aim 9 x orders uh, to get them out so that you can have them uh, when IFPIC delivers. My gut reaction is IFPIC, you know, does IoT and E in 2025 and, you know, you know, delivers at the battery level, you know, if we're lucky, I think, but battalion level by landing um, in 2026. I think almost everything about if picks move to the right every time I've looked at it. So 2026, 2027, 2028, you take your choice on that. So what we're not going to have is a cruise missile defense system out there. And that's, of course, very necessary if you're doing important like submarine reloading operations at the submarine base in Guam, which will not be defended by the bigger THAAD or um, Aegis systems uh, that are doing um, SRBM and R IRBM defense of the island. Um, and so we're at real risk, I think. Um, also, the Aegis radar, the um, TIPI-6 or SPY-7 radar faces themselves are at risk from being attacked by cruise missiles while they're oriented to protect you from uh, ballistic or maybe hypersonic glide uh, missiles. So real risks there. Uh, we're really betting heavily on IFPIC. How we ended up betting really heavily on a system that, you know, I like to say IFPIC's the Phoenix Suns of missile defense. It's always two years away from being two years away. If we need proof of that, the Phoenix Suns tanked it four nights ago, right? You know, we're at this point now where, um, where we're, we're stuck with this. Um, the other issue that I want to, uh, the other two issues I want to bring up, one is hypersonic missile defense. And by hypersonic missile defense, I mean it as we've traditionally understood it, hypersonic glide vehicles missile defense. Not what John Hill like ascribed the other day in testimony where he kind of moved his hands past and said, sure, we do hypersonic defense. Um, you know, and the senators, many, you know, walked away thinking, oh, we can do hypersonic glide missile defense. He, of course, was talking about hypersonic ballistic missile defense, which of course we do. Most ballistic missiles end up being, you know, hypersonic near the end of flight. Um, so please, uh, you know, we do, we're talking about hypersonic glide uh, maneuvering missile defense. And for that, we have very little capability, and we're only putting about three to five hundred million from what you can see in the budget into this effort. I, I contrast that with our hypersonic offense, which is three to five billion. The problem, of course, is in, in, as, a, as a democratic state who practices deterrence, we shouldn't be interested in our offense against their offense. We should be interested in our defense against their offense. And if we're not spending enough on defense, it's going to be very hard to catch up. So I'm hoping that the Congress is able to find some areas to put money into this. I, I, I think there may have been some, believe it or not, unfunded on this in the MDA unfunded list, although it's hard to tell. So that's the second issue. The first issue is that defense of Guam. We struggled into it. We're there. Now we just got to really bet on IFPIC. The second is hypersonic missile defense, where we got to get more money into it. And the third is I think that Congress should be innovative and force the services to address the issue of uh, dirigibles in a uh, air, air missile defense environment. Look, I, I'm not, it's not just that there's the proven capabilities that we saw in J-Lens before it got underway and screwed up Uncle Fester's farm in Baltimore or Pennsylvania, I get that. Um, it's just amazing to me the degree to which we will walk away from J-Lens when we have airplanes that crash all the time. We have ships that don't operate as expected. We don't cancel the whole program because we're embarrassed. This was ridiculous. A persistent, capable, medium to high altitude air defense radar is absolutely value added in the missile defense environment. Um, and look, the country that invests its money smartest 
and defending itself against all kinds of threats doubles down on that, Israel. They looked at JLens and said, hey, that was the right idea, and they have basically reconfigured JLens out in the desert. We need a JLens in Guam. We probably need a JLens in Ramstein. We uh, probably need one in the Masar area, but let's start with Guam. Let's have the services study it. Um, you know, Ricky, as, as you and I know, our, um, our SHIELDS uh, program at USC, a group of really smart uh, uh, young men and women looked at this and have come up with a, a policy paper on it. But I think it's time for the Congress to intervene. I do not think the services, for several reasons. One, the procul, I don't want to pay for it, for meat service. Second, the Army, who probably would end up getting it, just having that bad taste in their mouth from J-Lens. But we have got to put that aside and start thinking about how do we get a, a dirigible out there that can get fire and quality track data and pass it down to all these shooters through CE, cooperative engagement capability, or some other network. I only say CEC because long before we thought about JADC2 and fire and quality track data from every shooter to every sensor, the Navy for 30 years has been doing it with a system called cooperative engagement capability. A friend of mine who's an Air Force general once came up to me and asked me, what's this Keck system you guys are pushing? I'm like, it's cooperative engagement capability, CEC, and the Air Force has rejected it for 30 years. I get that now the Air Force has had an epiphany and realizes ubiquitous data from every sensor to every shooter you know, is of value, and the, the Navy's kind of locked down with the CEC, but use that in the dirigible, get that down to all the shooters, and you're going to have a much higher probability of kill of that incoming massive Chinese raid. And look, for people who say the dirigible might get shot down, yeah, B-52s are going to get shot down, B-1s are going to get shot down, even Corky flight as F-22 might get shot down. Pete, we are going to lose lots of aircraft, lots of ships, submarines, soldiers, sailors, airmen. I mean, this is not, we're not fighting a, uh, you know, this is not a CT fight, right? This is a near peer adversary or peer adversary in, in, in some realms. We're going to have to be able to, to uh, you know, to risk things to do it. And I think having dirigibles is going to help. I think having the service, having the department take an unbiased look at it and then using existing known, um, you know, uh, sy systems that are functional and out there, you know, like JLens or like the, uh, the, Isra the, the U.S. system that's in Israel, it's a U.S. company in Israel that ha have it up there. I think there's going to be real value added and it'll, it'll, it'll backstop and gap fill for the much needed E7 wedge tail. And if I can say one thing that's a little off of air defense, but it's critical to this budget, I love that the Air Force finally came around on wedge tail. You know, PACOM's been asking for it for years to replace the AWACS with an air breathing replacement. Um, they came around, they did the right thing. They've done all the right things. They talk about it all the time. And then getting it delivered early is an unfunded requirement this year. That is the clinical definition of insanity. This is the highest thing I need. Now the Air Force has to explain you have 179 billion or some high number like that budget. Could you explain how every dollar is more important than the E7, that it's on the unfunded priority list? And it's something you talk about in every Senate and House hearing as a critical system that needs to be get out. And in fact, you asked for and got forward funding money last year for it. So I'm a little frustrated with that. And that's one more thing I'd add in. It, it has an air defense implication, although not uniquely an air defense system. So, Ricky, that's, those are the kind of the, the yeah. I guess, the four thoughts. Thanks, I Mark. And I, I just want to follow up with you on the hypersonic. Because yeah. of what we've seen is that the, the hypersonic glide phase interceptor is not going to be done to the early 30s. You, you've slowed down the HPTSS, which has got to be developed. So, and John Hill said in testimony that we have terminal defense in the SM6, basically. And if we have BLS on Guam with SM6 or on the MRC, is that good enough to handle that threat from China until the mid 30s? And <laughs> What is the overhead persistent? Is it a tower? They're putting it on towers versus what we're talking about, some sort of dirigible plane. So yeah. that, that seems to be a lot of money sitting there, $8 billion, and, and we have a vulnerability that we're not addressing rapidly to deal with. Unless you yeah. tell me something. Um, so, okay, so first thing I'd say is on the, um, uh, uh, is SM6 in a, in a uh, terminal defense mode enough for hypersonic? No. 100% no. A, your SM6 better be located at your target. 
right? If you're going to be doing terminal defense with it. So that's your first problem. You want to get something that's getting them in the mid course. You want that uh, glide phase intercept and you want it as fast as you can get it. And if there's any unfunded money on that, that's almost criminal. I'm hoping there isn't. I'm suspecting there is. But in, in addition to that, we need to be pushing. This needs to be one of the places where you don't worry about, am I going to be yelled at next year because I wasn't efficient with this money? When you're talking about a critical deterrence, uh, you know, deterrence busting kind of capability from the adversary, you need to be unique and innovative and aggressive in tackling it. And I just think, you know, for MDA, it's like one more mission. You know, it's like, you know, you can't plot along like this, like you, you, you do with GBI. I mean, we're just at this point where we need to make a dynamic investment in this and we need to be aggressive. And if, you know, I almost want Congress to say you're forgiven in advance if this doesn't go perfectly, because we've got to learn to, you know, we've got to like, we got to experiment right to the point of failure on this so that we can get glide phase intercept as fast as possible. And I think that's like a skill set that's practically lost in the uniform services and, and one that the Congress doesn't reward historically. So we got to get there. If you think back to how we first developed, you know, Gardner, all these guys developed our, uh, our ICBM systems, our Navy's SOBM systems, these were crap shows, like missed first out of 15 times, you know, 0 for 15. You know, Gen you know, if General Shriver had been, had been, you know, fired after five failures, he'd have been fired three times before he figured out, you know, how to build, you know, an important leg of our triad. But we don't, we don't understand that right now. And I, God, you know, I respect John Hill, but we're at the point now where MDA needs to, needs to take some risk and get out there and solve this glide phase, inter push glide phase intercept. Mark, and, what about the SDS, the, the, the sensor aspect of it? Are we much further ahead on that than, than the glide phase intercept? Is that just the more resources going into I mean, that? I don't know. You're asking me like, you know, like there's two guys still like stuck in the track blocks and you're asking me, you're asking me, you know, which one's ahead? I don't know. Uh, but we got to invest in both of them. I don't want to make it sound like it's one system. It's yeah. an, you know, it's an enterprise. But the ballistic missile defense, the hypersonic, you know, I guess I have to say it this way. Otherwise, it'll be manipulated by uh, DOD personnel testifying at Congress and it's sounding like things are okay. The hypersonic maneuvering glide missile challenge is not being met in sensors and in shooters and we need to get we need to get that we need to get that moving off top dead center right and get that engine going with innovation and risk taking okay thanks mark we got the perfect guy to answer all this our favorite guy our youth so ladies and gentlemen neil thurgood 37 years rapid army rapid acquisition he is all over he's up more on the offense but we got to get him back on the defense on this hypersonic uh issues that we're having. So welcome, Neil. It's great to have you. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, a little delayed getting on there, so I appreciate your patience. Thanks for letting me join today. Do you, all, do you want me to jump in on the defensive piece? Yeah, no, I want you to uh, just give us a little bit what you think from a, maybe from the Army acquisition perspective of what you would like to see in the NDAA here and where the challenges are and what's not being addressed to help the, the nation get better what we're doing in this defense. Yeah, uh, super. Thank, thanks, Ricky and, and and Mark and the rest of the team that's that's there. Thanks for letting me join today. Look, at, it, at the end of the day, uh, there's a lot of discussion about acquisition reform in the big A, which is requirements definition all the way to the death of a of a product. Um, I, I'm I, I I don't think we need acquisition reform. I think we need behavior reform. <laughs> the, the the Congress has given us a set of laws that allow us to do and move at the pace that that we need to move. Um, the question is, do we are we comfortable with that as a as a DOD acquisition requirements generation community? And I think sometimes we struggle with that. You know, my last job, as you indicated, Ricky, was to to not change the law. My job was to behave differently and and to teach and help the department learn that you can do acquisition from requirements definition to to the end a little bit differently on a different pace there are times and i think hypersonics is one of them and there are other areas where we must behave differently we must press harder we must accept risk that is known and understood 
That doesn't mean this it's going to work all the time. That means we accept risk in a known way and we evaluate the risk. So Johnny Wolf and I, Vice Admiral Wolf, a dear friend of mine, we spent a lot of time on on risk decisions and a lot of great hard conversations on some risk we were willing to accept and some risk we weren't willing to accept. But accepting that at a pace that allows you to meet the requirements of 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 what we need as a national defense weapons uh, to be uh, put our nation in a, in a position to win its war, should we be, should our military be put in that position? In terms of of the hypersonic defense, you know, which I know Vice Admiral Hill is working hard on, as Mark indicated, we, we must press <laughs> now. Now is the time to step on the accelerator, not not back off the accelerator. We should be asking for all the money that we need and then some, because something's going to go wrong. When you accelerate programs, you don't accelerate because you think it's going to go perfectly. <laughs> you accelerate with the risk of understanding where you think the potential failures are going to happen, and then you react quickly to those failures. And so, in, in Congress wants that. My my experience with Congress in the last four years is, as long as you may remain 100% transparent with them, which I was, I went over there every quarter, talked about every penny I spent, every test we did, what went well, what didn't go well, 100% transparency. Then yeah. then they'll ask you to press. You know. You know, there's some flight tests that we were public about that didn't go as well as we wanted them to. Almost every time I had a flight test that didn't go as well as we wanted to, I got a note that night from a members of Congress, keep testing, <laughs> keep going. And so we have this ability in some areas, how hypersonic is one of them, where we really should be pressing really hard. Uh, I know Vice Admiral Wolf, who's still serving, and my replacement, Lieutenant General Rash, are, are, are uh, working hard at that. Uh, and 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 by the way, there is no at the pace um, when when uh, Johnny Wolf and Vice Admiral Hill and I are all there together, we actually combine offensive defensive learning at the same time. We don't have time to do an offensive program and a defensive program. <laughs> you, you've got to use every test event to learn as much as you can about the offense and the defense, and that's what we were doing. Um, we. We, we have got to put our nation in a position that we're called on to defend this nation that that we can we can win the fight on both sides of the equation offense and defense uh, at the end of the day so so I think there's a lot of work to be done uh, in, in the language I would encourage uh, our our defense department and our Congress to, to seek the dollars at the pace we need them right CRs are terrible things when you're buying equipment <laughs> they're terrible things and, and we all understand why they happen but there's an automatic automatic ripple effect down through the chains of command so to speak from the congress the department all the way down to the pm when when the money doesn't come at the pace it needs to come or is delayed off the pace that we need so if you put a plan in place and and this and a continuing resolution changes the arrival of the dollars that changes how you can make payments to our industry partners and our labs who are doing that work. And that pace slows. And so, you know, we got to really be clear on the dollars that we need. And then we need to be clear in the language of the NDA that those dollars uh, need to be treated a little bit differently. And they can be under the rules of a CR, by the way. We don't have to do the cookie cutter solution, which we always tend to do as a department. We we could we could make some programs keep it right on track. To your point, Ricky, if it's a priority, as as the General McConville always says, if it's a priority, then make it a priority. <laughs> you don't say it's a priority and then treat it like it's everything else, you know, in, in the in the department. Uh, so I, I think that's really important to to for those perspectives. Uh, if that's helpful. Thanks, Neil. And as we mentioned, I believe it's only two percent of the MDA budget is on. On uh, the blue, excuse me, the uh, hypersonic glide vehicle interceptor. Only one percent is on HPTSS. So that's not big investment to get this thing, as you said, going forward. Would would you have? I mean, I don't know what that figure should be. And also, could you comment on where we're at from IBCS to to getting a if pick in line because there's. That's supposed to be our next Christmas. Mark went into it. It's still being projected out like it always has been, and we lack a cruise missile defense capability right now, which the NACM can fill. But where are we on this to get this thing moving 
it's important for our for our country and for the you know aspect. Yeah, yeah no, thanks, Rick. That's another another really good question. You know, I, I don't know what percentage of the budget for MBA is those numbers you use. I, I you know, I, I don't know that those are. I assume those are correct. And I, I wouldn't say that the percent of but a budget is the right metric. What I would say is, did did Vice Admiral Hill ask for the money he needed on the timeline he needed it, and was yeah. that money given? Whether that was one percent or twenty percent or a hundred percent. I don't know that that's the right metric. The right metric to me is, yeah, sure. did we ask the right for the right dollar figure, and did we get that on the time to meet the timeline that Vice Admiral Hill's been given? If that answer is yes, then he asked for the right amount. But that timeline's projected out further. Who, who puts that timeline out further? Is that the SEC or the? That, or the that's secretary? exactly. Yeah, that's exactly so, right. So it's not John Hill. It's it's that right on when well, that projection is needed. Yeah, so it might be that that John Hill said, or you know, he, he asked for that amount of money for the time he was given, and that's what he needed. I, I don't know that. I don't know that priority. Of course, at the sec death level, you know, they're making a thousand trade offs every day. So I, I couldn't even speculate on on, you know, the wicked hard decisions they're making um, from 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 that perspective. But clearly, hypersonics is a is a unique case where where our adversaries publicly talked about their capabilities and, and we're working on our capabilities uh, mm -hmm. on both sides of that equation. In, in terms of IBCS, uh, first, congratulations to the Army to get a full rate production decision. I mean, I, I got a lot of on my own scar tissue in that program uh, and and that's it's really, really hard. You know, in, in the construct, the services have a, 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 a integrated coordinated command and control system for the lower tier that matches to the upper tier, which is C2BMC. Um, and so so now the Army has its piece in place to link to the upper tier, you know, which is under uh, Vice Admiral Hill, uh, C2BMC, and then IBCS links into that. Um, and re remember, IBCS uh, was constructed originally as an air defense program, right? Air de ballistic missile program. And so over over time, what we've done is we've, like we always do, because we learn as we go and the threat changes as we go. Now it needs to also be a cruise missile program, <laughs> right? So we've added mission sets to it, to because the threat has changed, which is appropriate and the right thing to do. So so congratulations to General Zano for getting that to to a full rate production decision, and now they'll start fielding that, and they'll start fielding that in a sequence. That all the all the other existing systems that are that are air defense or counter U.S. systems that are command and controlled by uh, FAD C2 or A FATADS, they have to keep working, you know, until the whole IBCS program is fielded. So we should anticipate, rightfully so, that we're not going to snap our fingers and everybody's going to be IBCS instantaneously. It's not going to happen that way. It, it'll happen over time, unit by unit, as we field that. The other part of that is. This the idea of a ubiquitous network that's everywhere all the time is also not ready yet. <laughs> so so we have to still be in a position where indiv individual weapon systems, particularly in the ground force, have to operate in austere locations independent of the network. So an IPCS can do that, you know, at the air defense level. Well, that we need to roll into that stuff like IFPIC that you're talking about. Uh, the mid the mid range shore ad both kinetic energy directed energy all those have to be rolled in in terms of ifpic um, you know there's three parts to that three parts to that program it's the kinetic interceptors in which you referenced and and, and today we have nasams and we bought iron domes to help fill some of that gap um, and the army has a timeline uh, to do that I, I, I if i was out of the fire center general lozano talked about that um, what the Army, now that they have a full rate production decision for IBCS, then they'd simply have to make the decision in the next two years or three years, do I, how quickly do I want to roll IFPIC into IBCS or do I want to keep it in the FAD C2 domain? That's the decision that General Zano and the Army is going to have to make. And, and they're probably in the process of making that decision. But remember, the IFPIC is a, a kinetic energy killer, a directed energy killer, and a high power microwave killer, right? Anytime you're talking about uh, air defense in the terminal phase, we want to talk about that in, in terms of layered defense, right? Kill things as far as away as you can and keep killing them as long as you can until they're on you. 
Um, and so having the ability to kill kinetically with directed energy in terms of high energy lasers and direct energy in terms of high power microwave is all part of that layered defense strategy. Um, similar, you know, the Army has chosen an approach that they were did that with Iron Dome. We you know we have NASAMs today that we're using as you know in our defense structure. You know, if 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 pick for some reason on the KE side or the DE side stumbles, then we might want to consider as a nation fielding more of what we have. Right? It may not be the best solution, but as I used to tell everybody all the time, killing one thing is better than killing no things. <laughs> So, so if we have a system, it may not be optimal, but it can kill a cruise missile defense, then, then let's get that out there and tell the thing we really want, we can get out there at, at the pace and speed we need to. And that's the naysam argument, basically, until that comes out. Mark, do, do you have any questions for him? I know we're a little over time, but I, I want to go over to you, Mark, and then open up the questions from the audience. Thanks, Neil. I, I don't. I agree. with I mean, We talked the other day. I, I agree. I mean, I think I, I feel a little better about if pick knowing there's a potential to do use FADC2. It's not that I don't believe that IBCS will someday be available, but I, I don't, you know, I think it's like starting to stitch together three signs of the cross, you know, to, to do if pick and IBCS in 2026. I'd rather if I, if I, if I felt that I owed the PACOM commander, you know, a, uh, a low cost, low E uh, cruise missile defense system in 2025, um, I'd be better on if pick in 2026. I wouldn't bet on if pick plus IBCS. So I, I think probably the right thing to do, and that's because IBCS has other responsibilities. There's, you know, working in LTAMs and, and uh, FAD uh, planning and things like that, you know, that it's going on. And I just don't want to get it dragged into something else. And so and I know FADC, you know, it can use Link 16, Link 11, JREAP, you know, all the kind of like typical systems that um, that we integrate. In fact, you know, the big SPY-7, TIPI-6, the same thing, radar looking, we'll see something, or the dredge I talked about, or an E-7, or an E-2D, pass it down to the Aegis Web Control System, which will push it out through the uh, JMTC or through, you know, just directly through Link 16 to the uh, FADC2. And the, and the FADC2, you know, goes from being double A AA to triple A or triple A to major league, you know, and all systems work like that. Two DDGs working together work like that. They take themselves from triple A to major league by operating that way. Um, so I'm, I'm a fan of that. So yeah, in general, I think we're, we're in, in bond agreement. My only worry is, if this stuff slides, you know, there's no, there's limited value in having a wicked good SRBM, IRBM, hypersonic glide missile defense system in Guam. If you can't take, you know, a, a, a crap ton of, uh, of cruise missiles coming at you. Because if there's one thing the Chinese have above all others, it's a crap ton of cruise missiles and launching systems, whether it's air launch, submarine launch, surface launch, or ground launch, they got them all. They got them all in numbers. Yeah, you know, it's, it's an interesting point, Mark. You know, Colonel Hill, the, the great the great PM down there in PL Missile Space, working for General Lozano, um, you know, they're they're having that discussion right now about that very point that we're talking about, right? Just do I do I put, do, you know, a year ago, if you had a conversation about about M Shore Rad or IFPIC into IBCS, the answer was no, because we weren't at the point where we got to a full rate production decision. Now they're at that point, then then they, they're having those conversations. When is the right time to cut in, and will it be mature enough? And because we're going to learn IBCS, right? Every time we field a new piece of equipment, we learn a lot. It's super, it's super great. And and so those conversations are, are going on, and and that will be um, the first part. The second part is remember all the air defense systems that are out there now um, speak in FADC2 today, <laughs> fundamentally. Um, so they've got to be rolled into this. So how do you do that? Do you do you federate it into the system or do you integrate it into the system, right? Do I put a wrapper around it and keep it kind of as a fad C2 with a wrapper and, and have the interface that way or do I push it fully integrated into IBCS? And I know Chris Hill and his team are having those conversations. So it's a, but it's really important to the timing. Um, and to your point, Mark, 
the, the COCOMs get a big vote in in the timing of, of that building that equipment and its capabilities. So that'll all play into the discussion. Hey, Ricky, I'd like to pile on real quick on the NASAMs. I, some good points have been made here, and I just want to uh, just reinforce that NASAMs has proven itself, period, dot, in Ukraine. And, uh, you know, there's, we're looking at, at it for other places, right? Uh, we can't get it fielded soon enough, but as far as the 24 NDAA, as we, as we try to accelerate fielding NASAMs in other areas, uh, realize that's competing for resources uh, that the Navy and the Air Force uses on their airplanes in the way of AMRAMs and A9Xs. And so, again, Congress could, could help out here by you know, putting some money towards that and putting some emphasis towards um, getting the, the resources we need so that we can fully outfit not only the NASAMS batteries that we're going to field for ourselves and some key uh, allies or, or, or partners, uh, not only the fire control systems, et cetera, but also the missiles. We've got to have more effectors uh, as soon as possible. Over. Corky, I'd like to ask one question we didn't ask. Over the fight up, over the five years, is boost phase missile defense from aircraft on sorties after the first, say for North Korea, for North Korea, is that viable? Is that worth investment in for development to do something like that? Or is that just not applicable? I, I don't think it's the best place to put resources, Ricky. I mean, you, you're talking about, you know, specifically if you're talking about mobile launchers inside a highly defended area, uh, you got to be in the exact right spot when that thing launches to get it before it uh, before it exceeds the capability of whatever effector you have on the air platform that's that's close enough to try to get after it. I, I think there are there are better ways. Uh, um, starting with having policy to take out launchers if you find them before they launch, and then after that having the sensors that Mark was talking about, the effectors that you and Mark and Neil have been talking about to hit them in the in the glide phase. Okay, but there are but. As you look in the future, that that opportunity, whether it's in space and that left, you know, in that launch period, doesn't have to be aircraft. It could be something else, but that seems to be a very cost-efficient way to deal with this problem. Yeah, and I, I, I wouldn't rule. I, I wouldn't rule anything out. out. I wouldn't yeah. rule anything out. Yeah. Neil, would you want to say anything on that? Because you, you you understood the ABL as we built that, and where where possible future capabilities. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a really good point that has been brought up. Um, you know, from an operational perspective, it's always better to kill a missile on the ground <laughs> if you can. <laughs> Never let it get in the air. So, so that's the start point of any kind of conversation. Then you get to the, the realistic outcome of that, right? Uh, particularly with mobile, mobile uh, transport vector launchers, um, you know, do we have, you know, how good will our intelligence be on the buildup? and the movement of, and then to the location of the movement, and then how much time will we have from, you know, the TEL uh, launch process, the missile launch process on a TEL, can we get an effector there in whatever means, right? A ground means, an air means, a sea means, whatever we can, can we get the effector there fast enough that they can't get the missile off the rails before your effector gets to the missile? Um, the, I think the thing that is challenging for us is, uh, technology is the point now where the ranges of missiles are becoming so long that you can do a lot of those launches from very secured, sequestered positions, which which makes it even much harder, right? Um, and that works on both sides of the equation. You know, us to kill their uh, offensive weapons and, and theirs to kill our offensive weapons. So I, I think it's really hard. Um, I, I think we have to uh, you know, the other principle of, of war here is we got to have more than one way to kill the enemy. <laughs> you, you just can't put all your eggs in one basket. You got to have multiple ways to do it. And that kind of gets, Ricky, back to your question about, you know, the priorities and, and how those priorities get made. And, and those are wicked hard trade offs. So I hope that that's useful. Over. Mark, I'm going to hand it over to you on, on any Q&A or final comments. Yeah. Um, good. The. Uh... Well, look, all the questions that were pre-sent to us got answered in the in the discussion. That was good. One of the ones that was just sent in is I'll take it. I'll answer it, and we'll and we'll just wrap from here. Um, 
it says, if we found ourselves in an enduring conflict, but we have adequate systems of manufacturing to carry out a long-term multi-front war, no. All right, that's, that's pretty simple answer. I, I'll say, we did this to ourselves. Um, we all understand that factories have minimum uh, uh, minimum sustainment rates and maximum available rates. We tend to brief the maximum available rate, and we hear that well. I can they can build 100 L rasms a year. Well, the minimum was 20, and we ordered 20 for five years straight. What the company does is, uh, and I'm making this up, this isn't the Elrazza, but in general in munitions, they lower the workforce down to your, your consistent ordering rate. If you consistently order 20, they build a workforce for 20. They would not make money as a company if they built a workforce of six, for 60 and you're only ordering 20. So um, unless you have a defense production agreement with them, of which there are a handful, but not for me, not for this, to maintain the capability which we're not drawing on, um, then you know basically the co the company you know you, the minimum sustainment rate becomes the maximum available rate. Now, when we want the maximum available rate, we need to plunk down money. We're doing that. Last year, there was a whole bunch of stuff done in the NDAA, and very little of it was funded directly in probes. One of the ones that was, was hundreds of, several hundred million dollars that basically go to primes to improve the, to move that minimum, minimum sustainment rate production more towards maximum available production or even more. This year's 24 budget, I think would be characterized as we built as many missiles as we can. We asked for multi-year authority to buy them and we put more investment into raising that minimum number you can build. This was for Javelins, 155, um, El Razum, SM6, a few other systems like that. So you're seeing this. So the answer is we're not there. There are things we can do policy-wise and authorization and appropriation-wise that will get us there. None of them will get us there tonight or tomorrow or next year. This is a year's, it took us 30 years to dig this hole of poor munitions, um, you know, uh, uh, of making munitions the bill payer. It'll take us some number of years to dig ourselves out of the hole. But the good news is, is you see a lot of spades around and a, and a lot of people committed to the effort. So I think we will, but you got to ask this question again in three years to get a, a straight answer. All right, thanks, Mark. Let's just wrap it up. And we'll start with Neil. Just what do you, what would you like to see in that NDA 24 as a must do? Just one or two things from this conversation and from your thought. Yeah, so I, I think the NDA can help us uh, in a couple of broad ways. Number one is be very, very clear with the money on the priorities and, and specify those priorities in the language because if as the further you go down, the priorities of the services might change and those dollars might be reallocated somewhere. Not because not because an evil thing. It's, it, they're all trying to do right choices, but but I would be very careful with how we address and, and allocate the dollars and put them in the right PEs and, and use those PEs appropriately. The second piece is, I'll, I'll just pull the last string that Mark talked about. The, our industrial base is gonna respond to, because of the way we created the industrial base since the 1950s, we've really got to get to to what, what I would term as the next generation prime, right? We've got to do that in munitions in particular, right? We've, we've been building munitions the same way for, for 60 years. We, we've got to look at new technologies and, and new methodologies. The government can help that. NDA language can help that by right, allocating dollars for industrial-based development um, and, and changing the way we, we do things. Um, it, this technology is certainly available. So I would encourage, you know, if we if we want to if we want to have munitions available at the pace we need them in high-order conflict, then we're gonna we we can't make them the same way we made them since 1950. We we've got to change how we make things and look at things. And and an industry needs government help. And congressional help to do that and, and i think the nda language can help with that so thanks for letting me join today i appreciate it ricky thank you all right thanks Neil. corky yeah thanks ricky thanks neil mark and uh, john who was on earlier i i think neil nailed it but it was basically a recap of my comments earlier we've, we've got to fundamentally be very directed from a congressional perspective on on try to change the way we do business thanks ricky thanks Corky. mark yeah, just what I said, get hot on hypersonics, fund the E7, uh, you know, get us get get some honest answers back on the value of dirigibles. And on the defense of Guam, look, I, I, we ended up in the least effective, most expensive, slowest plot process 
don't screw it up anymore. You know, knuckle down, get it done. And if, if picks the right thing, then go with, with Fadsy too, then go with that. If if there's any chance that there's slippage in that, then take a hard look at whether you can pull NASAMs without upsetting the Ukraine apple cart. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Great, great conversation. I, I would go back to the fundamental opportunity that we have today to change policy. There's no time better than the last 30, 40 years than it is today with the threat from China and from Russia to change our policy to enable us to do the capacity and development and capabilities to best deter a conflict between now and 28 for sure, but beyond that. And that policy is key to, to be rewritten, fixed, so we can play in the game that we need to be able to play in. And I think the capabilities will come underneath that in priority, and certainly we have to turn it up on hypersonic defense. We got to turn that thing up. And I would also say, we didn't talk much about it today, but the NGI also needs to be pushed to 27 and getting that thing out and fielded as well for that North Korean threat. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for the time. Uh, I appreciate each one of you for uh, contributing and furthering the advocacy and most importantly, the education uh, to, to our nation on this specific topic. Thank you.